Hello, church family. How's everybody doing today? Come on, help me welcome our online family joining us from all over the place as well. We are so glad that you are with us. And uh, we hope wherever you are, you are blessed. What well, is so good to be with you? No place I would rather be than with the CFC family. And uh, we have been in a series um, called The Lord's Prayer, The Lord's Prayer. And today, we're actually going to be bringing that series to a close. And uh, I hope you're proud of me. This may be one of the longest series that I've done in years. And so uh, typically I'm like, I'm good for about four and I'm moving on to the next thing. But man, this one has been so powerful and I pray it's been enriching to you. I know it has been to me. Why don't you grab your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six, uh, we're gonna read the Lord's Prayer and then we will pray. Uh, man, also just as a side note, our kids left Saturday, our teenagers are up at student camp right now. And uh, I'm told there's about 450 teenagers uh, up at Trinity Pines just going after God. Can you imagine the energy and the BO in that room? Can you imagine? And uh, so, man, we're just praying for a radical time of faith building, uh, that they would come back, uh, man, just experiencing God's presence. And uh, man, I want to challenge you, register for man camp. Uh, It's going to be absolutely amazing. We're going to finish the summer with that. Uh, It's just going to be a great time. We're going to go after God together. There's something that happens when you set your life apart for a couple of days to visit with God. It's an amazing thing. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, let's read together. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to highlight that last word in the Lord's Prayer today. Um, I want to focus on, we've talked about pretty much every topic you could look at through the Lord's Prayer. I want to focus on this last word that is so vitally important for the Lord's Prayer. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. I wanna talk about not just the prayer, but the faith to receive the promises of God through the prayer. And that's where the amen comes in. Amen literally means let it be. It, It is a declaration of assurance, of confidence, that what we have just prayed for is actually going to come to pass in our life. And so I want to pause and let's pray. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to prepare our hearts for his word, that our faith would be built, that we wouldn't just pray the prayers, that we wouldn't just seek these things, but we'd be able to receive them in our life. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much and we thank you for these next few moments. I pray every heart and mind would be ready to receive what you have. I pray a great release of faith into the church today. God, I pray that you would have your way, that you would build us up. I pray our hearts would be open, our minds would be open, that, Lord, we would have a great amen for everything you want to do in our lives. And we pray these things in your great name, Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to look at a passage of Scripture with you. If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, I want to look uh, at this, this, this account of Jesus doing a great miracle in the lives of two blind men. In Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 27, we'll put this on the screens for you as well, but I want to I wanna glean a couple of truths out of this that I believe are going to help us to be people that receive from the promises of God. Matthew 9, 27 says this, after Jesus left the girl's home, two blind men followed along behind him shouting, son of David, have mercy on us. They went right into the house where he was staying and Jesus asked them, do you believe that I can make you see? This is a very important question. Do you believe that I can make you see? Yes, Lord, they told him, we do. And then he touched their eyes and said, because of your faith, it will happen. Then their eyes were opened and they could see and Jesus sternly warned them, don't tell anyone about this, but instead they went out and spread his fame all over the region. They were disobedient little miracle recipients. 
But how many know sometimes God is just so good, you can't help but tell everyone about it. This is one of the few times that Jesus did a collective miracle in the body of several people all in one time and one setting. And I think it's worth noting, even as we open up this passage, that proximity to Jesus seems to be one of the great keys to finding the miracle that we need in our lives. There was something about just getting into the presence of Jesus. These men pressed in, pushed in to get into the very presence of God. And I think we would be remiss if we didn't at least acknowledge this simple truth as we open this topic and from this passage by just acknowledging this one very important thing. There is something about being where Jesus is. There's something about being right there in the presence of God. Now, Matthew 9, 28 says this about these men. They went right in to where he was staying. They went right in to where Jesus was staying. Now, we read our Bible with a strong hindsight bias. Come on, now, we know they got a miracle and they know, but can we just pull back and act like we don't know what happened on the other side? They went right in is like church of knees for breaking and entering. Come on. Like nobody gave them permission. They didn't ask any questions. They just broke right into the house that Jesus was staying. Now you put yourself in these shoes. Like let's say somebody's staying at your house and somebody just breaks in and two blind guys walk into your living room and they're looking for the guests you have staying in your house. Like this is not normal behavior for people to be acting up like this and breaking into your home and disturbing your guests. And we have other stories like this in the Bible too. One time there were four dudes that were trying to get a paralyzed friend into a house where Jesus was staying. And they actually went up on the roof, sawed a hole through the roof and began lowering this guy down, right down into the middle of the living room where Jesus was with a bunch of other people. Now we look at that story and we're like, oh man, what a cool story. Listen, that is at a minimum rude, at a maximum a felony. Okay, but there is something about being where Jesus is. There's something about proximity to Jesus that makes it way more likely that we will receive a miracle. In the presence of Jesus, miracles happen. Come on, in the presence of Jesus, anything is possible. In the presence of Jesus, the battle you're fighting, the struggle you're in the middle of, the doubt you're trying to push through, the internal thing you haven't told anyone about. In the presence of Jesus, anything is possible. And to teach from this passage and not mention the faith of these men to pursue Jesus would be sad. They followed him in and they found where he was and they went right in to the presence of Jesus. And I think it's important for us to realize, do you know we can still get right into the presence of Jesus? We can still get right in to the presence of God. He's not some God that's so far away that we can't experience his presence. No, we need to understand and know that we can still get right in to the presence of God. Let me give you a few keys that can help you get into the presence of God when you need to get into his presence. The first key is this, it is prayer and faith. Prayer and faith will bring you before the very presence of God. I love Hebrews 4.16. It says this, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. I love that. Let us come boldly before the throne of our gracious God. There, there we'll find mercy. There we'll find grace to help us. Listen, when you need God to do something in your life, you need to know that God is not so far that you can't get to him. Through faith, by prayer, you can come before the throne of grace anytime you want and find help from the very presence of God. I want you to write this down. The second key to getting into God's presence is through being at a meeting of believers. A meeting of believers. Matthew 18, 20 tells us for where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. You know, to reduce church attendance down to merely coming to church is not biblical. 
Not only that, it's not helpful for your understanding of what we're actually doing. When we come together as God's people, we're not just coming together as some club. We're not coming together as some group that sings some songs and listens to someone speak for a few minutes. No, when we get together as God's people, we are gathering together as children of God, as kings, as priests, as those he has saved and redeemed. We come together as God's people. And here is the promise. When we come together, God is in our midst. He's in our midst when we worship him, when we lift up praise to the King of Kings. The promise is his presence comes and he inhabits the praises of his people. What is the difference between a concert and a Christian gathering? Well, the difference between a con, there can be songs and there can be speaking, but there is no substitute for what Hebrews calls the assembling of ourselves together as the people of God. When we come together as God's people, it's different from other gatherings because we come together for the purpose of encouraging one another, of exalting the name of Jesus, of worshiping him alone. And when we do that, God himself comes into our midst. His presence is with us. You can't get the presence of God in any other, he hasn't promised to to, to rest upon a country music concert. He hasn't promised to rest upon rock or some kind of contemporary, some kind of hip hop. He said, when my name is lifted high, I will inhabit the praises of my people. And when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. It is the presence of God that sets us apart. It is It's the presence of God that lifts you up. When you come into a gathering of God's people, we should be expecting that his presence is going to meet us in this place. Listen, no offense to you, but I don't just come to church for you. Like, I love you. I love being around you. I love seeing you and your families and seeing my friends and all of that. But listen, when I'm coming to church, I'm coming with more of an expectation. I'm not just coming to see Cass or see Rick or or see Randy. I'm coming to see Jesus. I'm coming to meet with God. I'm coming to get into his presence. I need God's presence to touch my life, touch my mind, minister to my family. I want my children to get into the presence of God. And I want us to know that when we gather together as the people of God, we're doing more than seeing and experiencing each other. We are here to experience the presence of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit. If you believe that, shout amen. Amen. I love the Old Testament people, even the Hebrew people. They said, Moses, how will people know that we are yours? And God said, it's my presence that will go before you. And when God's people wanted to go, and even the Lord said, why don't you just go? And Moses stopped and he said, oh no, Lord, if you don't go, we won't go. How will anyone in the earth know that we are your people and you are our God if your presence doesn't go before us? He said, where you go, we go. That's all that we want. And can I tell you, that should be the heart of every follower of Jesus. Where God is, we want to be. And if his presence is there, I want to be there too. I want to get into God's presence. We should have a value for the presence of God. As we enter in, as we lift up our hands, as we gather together, we invite the spirit of the Lord into our midst to encourage us, to build us. We need his presence. The next key to getting before the Lord in the presence of Jesus is thanksgiving and worship. Psalm 95 verse two says, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, with spiritual songs. It's it's thanksgiving that, man, when we come before the Lord, it's a grateful heart. God, you've been so good to me. It's thanking him. It's praising him. It's, Lord, thank you for a new day. Thank you that I woke up. 
Thank you for my marriage. Thank you for my children. Thank you for wherever I am. And God, if I've lost something, I thank you that you're still good and you're still God and you've still got a plan for my life. I'm telling you, no matter what's been broken in your life, if you'll bring before the Lord a grateful heart, it will carry you into the very presence of Jesus. There's something about gratitude that opens up the door to his presence. And I just need you to know today that no matter where you are or find yourself, you are never stuck. You are never so far separated from Jesus that you can't get into his presence. I love the heart of King David. He said, where can I go that you are not right there with me? If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I'm up high on the mountaintop, there you are as well. You need to know that no place you find yourself today is so broken or so distant that you cannot get into the presence of Jesus. And if you can get into the presence of Jesus, Jesus, come on, anything is possible. Anything is possible. There's a miracle there. No situation is too hopeless. No situation is too bleak that the power of God cannot do something in your life. There is something about being where Jesus is. And this is important for us to understand. I want you to write this down, number two, because you will typically only have what you believe you can have. You will typically only have what you actually believe you can have. I love the question that Jesus asked these blind men. They walked in and he said, do you believe that I can make you see? Do you believe that I can make you see? And you might be wondering what, if anything, this has to do with your life. My friends, I'm telling you, it has everything to do with your life. What you believe has everything to do with your life. What you believe about Jesus is the most important thing that you form belief around. See, your life does not rise and fall based on your circumstances. Your life does not rise and fall based on your upbringing or your education or your socioeconomical status. Your life rises and falls based on what you believe. Matter of fact, you will allow people to treat you how you believe you should be treated. You will attempt to go as far as you believe you should and can go. You will pursue relationships with the people you believe you belong around. You will take care of yourself at the level you believe you should be cared for. You, you will push to accomplish what you believe you can actually achieve in life. Now let me bring this into the realm of the spirit for a minute. You will only reach for in the spiritual what you believe you have access to and what you believe Jesus can and will do in your life. What you believe about God and what he has for you are the most important things you will ever form belief around. As a matter of fact, one of the Old Testament prophets, Hosea, and Hosea the prophet, he said, well, actually the Lord speaks through Hosea in 4.6 and he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, I don't know if any of you grew up like me, but my daddy had a saying growing up, and he would say, you know what? What you don't know can't hurt you. That might be one of the biggest lies ever perpetuated upon a whole generation. Maybe that one and sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. How many know that was a big fat lie too? All right. Doesn't matter how you sing it, it's still wrong. But I remember growing up here and then, I don't I wanna hear what, what, what I don't know can't hurt me. I remember hearing that all of my life. And I think about this in our walk with God. Can I just tell you what you don't know can hurt you. What you don't know can certainly limit your life. Here's why. How can you reach out and receive from the promises of God? How can you reach out and take that which Jesus has made available to you if you don't know what Jesus has made available to your life? 
If you don't know it's there, my friends, you'll never have it. If you don't know what God has done, you'll never walk in the victory God's called you to. If you don't know what God has made available to you, then you won't be able to grab it and bring it into your life by faith. Jesus wants you to have everything he said you could have. But the knowledge of God and his promises are so important. Matter of fact, there are two types of knowledge worth noting. And the first one is this, it's the knowledge of God himself. This is knowing God personally. How many know that Christianity is far from just another religion? Christianity is actually a relationship, a real and living relationship with a real and living God. It's knowing the one true God. It's experiencing for yourself his forgiveness, his, his transforming power, his regenerative work in your life. The Christianity, I've heard people say sometimes, man, I don't know, my life was exciting before Jesus and now I know Jesus and my life is boring. I'm telling, if you know Jesus and your life is boring, you're doing it wrong. Following Jesus is one of the most hair-bending, exciting, wild things you will ever do in your entire life. God is so good and he's always doing good things in your life, but the knowledge of God, it's knowing him. It's knowing God. It's knowing how he works in your life. It's knowing his character and its nature. It, it comes from your history with God. It comes from being around people that have a history with God. I've heard some people they even say things like, well, how do you know that about God? It's like, because I know God like that. Because he's done that in my life before. Because I know many people he's done that in, his, in their life for. Because what God has done before, he will do again. How many shout amen? amen. God is consistent and God is faithful. But maybe even more importantly, it's the knowledge of God's word and promises. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's word and promises. And this is knowing what God has promised you. You know, the Bible is more than a history book. The Bible is a book that reveals God's character, his nature, his heart, his plan for humanity and redemption from the beginning of time all the way to the end of time and for all eternity. The Bible reveals to us all of these things, and more than that, the Bible is a book of promises. The Bible actually calls them great and precious promises. And every promise in the word of God, listen, it may not have been written to you, but it was written for you. If the promise is in there, you can have it too. God's promises are for any and all who would call upon his name and believe him for what he has made available to all of us. And if you don't know what God has in heaven for you, you won't take the steps of faith required to have what God's made available for your life. Let's just go back to the Lord's prayer. How did Jesus ask us to pray? He said, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Listen, on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's prayer is a cry for what God already has in heaven to be brought down into the earth. How many know that God already has all the power you'll ever need? God already has every answer you could ever want. God already knows the answer to every problem you've ever walked in. God has all the resources you could ever need for every problem you want. All the wisdom that could ever be exists with God in heaven. It's not a matter of can God do it. It's not a matter of if God has it. It's a matter of getting it from where God is into where we are. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the life of faith is a life of appropriating what is in heaven into our life here on earth. It's important that we know this. So we got to know what's in heaven for us actually to believe for in our life on earth. Do you want to know what's in heaven for you? I love Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 because it gives us this beautiful picture of all that God has made available for us. Ephesians 1 verse 3, listen to this. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. 
I love this passage. What has he blessed us with? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Some of us need to get this one deep down into our spirit because again, we'll only have in this life what we believe we have access to and have every right to have. So what do we have access to? Man, when you're praying, God, do you see me? Can you answer this thing? We need to remind ourselves, what has God promised us? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God, can you move in my marriage? Of course he can, because he's given you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God, can you do this in my family? Of course he can. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You need to remind yourself when you're in the good times and the bad times, in the light and the darkness. You need to remind yourself the same thing is true about God. He's made every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms available to you because you are united with Christ. How many would shout amen? Amen. This is what we have available to us. We're not left orphans. We're, we're, do you know there's not a single time in the Bible that God refers to you as ordinary people? Every time the Bible speaks to you as a believer, it says you're peculiar. You are a priest of God. You are a chosen one of God. You are an heir of Christ Jesus. All the words used to describe you who are in Christ are specific, powerful, blessing terms that that have everything to do with who God has made you to be. You're not the old person. You're a new creation. You're not an orphan. You're an heir of Christ. You're not in sin. You've been fully forgiven. You've been made new, made right. You're now kings and priests, sons and daughters of the most high God. And I'm telling you, sons and daughters have access to everything their father does. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And we must get this in our heart and in our spirit. When you pray, don't pray like someone who's unsure what they have access to. Remind your spirit when you come into the presence of God. I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Everything I need is available to me through Christ. If you believe it, shout amen. It's so important. As New Testament Christians, you're blessed with every blessing in Christ. Believe this. And we must ask ourselves if this is true, then why don't we all have what we need? If this is true, why don't we walk in the things we're believing for? And I think this is an important truth for us to grab a hold of today, and it's this. My final thought, and I want you to write it down today. Faith does not produce the blessing. It is your means to attaining it. Faith does not, listen, so many people have faith in their faith. Well, it's my, it's my faith. Listen, everything in God comes by grace through faith. It's not through faith and by faith. Everything comes by God's grace through faith. How did you get saved? Was it your great faith? No, it was by God's grace through faith. The moment you brought what little bit of faith you had into the equation, you were able to have access to the grace of God. How, if you... Listen, we get everything from God the same way. It's it's not our great faith. It's God's great grace. And it's as we direct our faith toward God's great grace that we begin to access all the things of heaven. I think where we get into trouble is where we magnify the faith over the grace. God has already made everything available to us. But it is our faith that helps us access it. I love this because in Matthew 9, 27, Jesus said this to these two blind men. He said, because of your faith, it'll happen. Because of your faith, it'll happen. Now listen to his words. This is Jesus. Now he could have said, because I'm the son of God, it'll happen. But he didn't. He said, no, because of your faith, it'll happen. See, God is God no matter what we need or don't need. He's God no matter if we're in a good season of life or a challenging season of life. Whether we're on the mountaintop or in the valley, he is God the same. And he has not changed. So you need to understand that God doesn't change because your circumstances changed. 
It's not, well, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is certainly available to me because I'm on the mountaintop. And then when you get to the valley, you're like, why, Lord? Why have the windows of heaven been shut up in my life? No, listen, it's actually when you're in the valley that you need to believe the most that every spiritual blessing in heavenly places has been made available to you. God doesn't change even when our life does. God doesn't change even when our relationships do. God doesn't change even when our circumstances shift. God is God the same. And everything he's promised you is true on the mountain. And everything he's promised you is true in the valley. In other words, all the blessings we need already exist in heavenly places. But I need you to catch this. It is our amen that pulls them through. It's our amen that opens up our own lives to receive that which God has already given to us. I wanna give you a very important scripture and it's 2 Corinthians chapter one, verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter one, verse 20, it says, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. All of God's promises have been fulfilled with a yes. So you need, to, you need to reframe what you believe God's response is to you. God, do you want me to be forgiven? It's a great big yes from heaven. God, do you want my family to be forgiven? It's a great big yes from heaven. God, do you wanna restore my life? Do you wanna transform my life? Do you wanna heal my life? Do you wanna set me free from the bondages that are holding me back from living the life you've called me to? It's a great big yes from heaven. I'm telling you, the light is green in heavenly places. All of the promises of God have been fulfilled with a great big yes on God's part. And through Christ, it is our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. And so I need you to see there's a cooperation between heaven and our lives. God has said yes, but will we say amen? God has said yes, but will we say yes to receiving the promises of God in our life? Will we have the faith to believe that God's promises are not just for other people. It's not just for other people that look like they're more churchy than you. Other people that have more of a history with God than you. Some of you are here today and, and you say, if, if you had any idea what I've done and where I've been, you'd be questioning whether God's promises are for me as well. Can I tell you, I know every promise of God is for you because coming back to the promise of salvation, the Bible says, for when we were all sinners, God died for us. He sent his son Jesus to, before any of us did anything right, God sent his perfect son to pay the price for every single one of us. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes on him would not perish but would have everlasting life. And I'm telling you, if one promise is for you, all of the promises are for you. Every promise of God is for you. No matter where you've been and what you've done, there is a yes in heaven that is available for you. And if you would respond with, yes, Lord, I receive what you have done for me. I'm telling you, you'll be forgiven. You can be set free. You can be healed. The favor of God can rest upon you your life, your life can be different because of the God who gave everything for you. He's already said yes to every spiritual blessing, but we must have faith for an amen. I'm telling you, faith is not simply a belief inside. It's not. Faith is a confidence that leads to action. Faith is not even a natural thing. Faith is a spirit act. Faith does not originate in the mind and it doesn't originate in our emotions or in our circumstances. I don't care how you feel today, faith can operate in your life because faith is not based on feelings. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad it's not always when you feel good that you can actually use your faith? No, 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 emotions happen in the natural. Your thinking happens in the natural, but faith happens in your spirit. Faith is a spiritual action. It comes from God. It's something that moves us toward him. Faith begins in the spirit, but my friends, it leads to action in our lives because without works, faith is dead. 
there's always an action to whatever you're looking for that begins to pull the blessing through the veil of heaven into your life on earth. Listen, faith will manifest itself in physical action. Listen, sometimes faith, it looks like praising God. When nothing's going right in your life, you choose to lift up your eyes and say, God, I praise you anyway. My life is junk, but you are amazing, and I choose to praise you anyway. Sometimes faith looks like praying. God, I don't see the blessing. I don't see the answer. I don't see the healing coming in my life, but I'm choosing to bring this to you again in faith, believing that the same God who did this before can do this again. It's faith to pray, to believe again. Sometimes faith looks like waiting. Sometimes faith looks like waiting. Now we have an American mindset about waiting. Waiting to us is like, oh God, when is it going to happen? There's a powerful passage of scripture in Isaiah that's very popular. It says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Do you know that word wait on the Lord? It's not the passive, grumpy waiting we would know in our American culture. That word wait in Isaiah, it actually means to lean in and wait in eager and anxious expectation, knowing and believing and standing in confidence that God is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. God, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm expecting that blessings right around the corner. I haven't seen it yet, but I know that miracle is on the way. I'm waiting and I'm expecting that you're going to be doing some good things in my life. Sometimes faith looks like thank God. And it's just gratitude. God, thank you that I'm here. Thank you that you spared me. Thank you that you're doing good things all around me. I praise you for what you are doing while I wait for what you haven't done yet. But I know my answer is in heaven and I know you're a good God that's sending it into my life. So I'm waiting and I'm thanking you. Sometimes faith looks like tithing, looks like sowing, looks like speaking. I'm telling you the miracles are on the way. This is why we can't give up in our doing good because if we don't give up we're going to see the miracle hand of God move in our life can I just pause for a moment and say this is why we can't give up on our nation we serve the same God he's the same yesterday today and forever and I refuse to be a preacher and I refuse to let us be a church that believes God was one way before but he's not that way now I'm telling you our God still heals our God still saves our God still delivers our God still does miracles. And can I tell you, our God can still turn nations around for his glory and for his people. What would happen if we begin to pray and collectively bring an amen among God's people? That God, we know things are getting crazy. We know things are getting dark. It's a midnight hour for America. But I'm telling you, if we bring an amen, he's still the God that can change a nation in a day. What America needs is Jesus. What America needs is a move of God's spirit. And I'm telling you, it's still faith if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Will he not hear from heaven? Will he not turn his face to us and forgive us again and bring revival to America one more time? God, we say amen. We believe you're that God. We're asking you again, send your rain upon our nation. We believe you can turn it around again. We believe you do miracles in our life, and we believe you do miracles in our nation. Come on, if you believe it, give God one more praise. Lord, we believe. We say amen, and we believe you. We believe you're the same God who's always been. And God, nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. As our prayer teams come, I wanna say nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. What God's done, he can do again. He can do miracles in your life. He can restore your physical body. He can touch your mind. He can break addictions off of your life. I'm telling you, our God is able. Whatever you need today, 
what, I thank God for doctors and I, I thank God for counselors, but there's some things it's only King Jesus can do in your life. Sometimes we need more than a natural touch. We need the touch of heaven upon our minds and upon our lives. I'm telling you, God can do a miracle in you. He's already postured himself with a yes, but will the church say amen? And Lord, we just wanna say amen to every promise, to every blessing, to your will for our nation, from the White House to the mayor's office in Nampa, Idaho. We pray, oh God, for a move of your spirit. Let it rain. May the promises of God come to pass in our nation. If, if something doesn't happen, Lord, I don't want it to be because the church refused to say amen. And so we say it together. Come on, on the count of three, let's say amen to every promise of God. One, two, Three, amen, amen. Come on, lift your hands to heaven all across.